Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is David Levy. I'm director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, and I'm really pleased to welcome you here to this event tonight, where um, we're going to uh, be launching um, a book by Naomi Saka called Transformations in Egyptian Journalism, which um, is available for sale over there after the event at a heavily discounted price. You won't find it cheaper anywhere other than here. Um, so I'm really pleased to welcome you and Naomi here tonight. Um, I, uh, firstly, this event, we're grateful to the Open Society Foundations who've helped support this event. Um, so um, that's why the event is free, and it also is why there will be drinks afterwards downstairs if you, um, when we get to the end of the discussion. So um, it's, I think it was the summer of 2011 when I first started talking to Naomi to seeing if we could persuade her at the Reuters Institute to write about what was happening in Egyptian journalism in the wake of the revolution then. And um, she said that she'd been willing to, and, um, but it would take a little time. And so the, the work was started in 2012, and Naomi did an amazing job during the course of 2012 of writing a detailed analysis of what was happening, of its origins, and some thoughts about the implications of what was happening for the future. Um, she did a, an impressive job because it's both a, a, an admirably well-researched piece of work and also a piece of research that was written in real time, if you like. Um, while all the events um, were taking place, as indeed they still are today. But I think it's fair to say that the cutoff point in terms of what of, of the book was roughly late autumn of 2012. Is that fair, Naomi? Absolutely, yeah. yes, yes. So um, we'd see tonight how much, how much has changed since then, um, or whether the fundamental arguments uh, remain the same. Um, it's also very good to be able to do, have this discussion about Naomi's book just about two years since the revolution um, in February 2011. What's going to happen this evening is Naomi, uh, who's professor at um, Westminster University, will, will present her book and her findings for around 10 minutes. Then I'm going to turn to Mustafa Mashawi, who's on the right here, who's an Egyptian journalist who reported for BBC Arabic service from Cairo during the early phase of the revolution, as well as doing lots of other reporting from many other places over many years. Um, he's um, the reason he's here in London he's now a PhD student rather than a reporter and he's um, he's a researcher rather than a reporter but I'm sure one day you'll return to reporting after you've um, been on this little excursion perhaps who knows um, so Mustafa Mashawi will follow on from Naomi first and then we're very lucky as well to have Walter Armbrust here from Oxford University from St Anthony's College in Oxford University who will um, who's university lecturer in modern Middle Eastern studies there and who will also respond for five to ten minutes. The plan is that we, over the next course of the next half hour, all of us on the platform, will have, Naomi will have presented her findings, uh, Mustafa and Walter Ambrus will have responded, and then we move on to discussion about 7.30, and we'll run discussion from 7.30 to just after 8, that there's a chance to buy a book if you want, and then there's drinks downstairs. So, that's enough from me. Firstly, over to Naomi to present her findings and give us a, a, a sense of what she's found out in the book. Naomi. Uh, thank, thank you very much, and um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, can you hear me okay? I can't, I'm not very, it's okay? It sounds okay? Good. Um, okay, well, I, I came from Cairo this morning, actually, um, and I won't go into the reasons why I cut it so fine coming the very day of the launch, but um, David was talking about events. And my route to the airport this morning went through the, um, the space in front of the Itadia Palace where there was um, violence recently that went viral. There was a man who was um, assaulted by security uh, forces and stripped and all the rest of it. But anyway, the, the thing is that the camera footage of that incident, which was taken from many angles by many different people in different degrees of, of precision, um, has, has, has been very much the focus of media coverage in, in the last couple of days. So really, that's a kind of continuation of, of where we started with the revolution, that, that, that the camera phone footage, um, there's no escape, there's no hiding from what actually happened. Um, so the other thing about just coming straight from Cairo is I have a very strong sense of the mixed emotions um, that everybody's experiencing two years on. Um, so there's a mixture of good and bad. You know, I mean, 
some people will tell you it's all bad. Some people, <laughs> if you're, you know, Ikhwan, probably it look. If you're Muslim brother, it, it, it looks uh, probably more promising. Um, but I, I want to preface my remarks by, like, summarizing some of the good and bad because it forms a backdrop and a, and a sort of underpinning to the approach I took in the monograph. Um, so, for example, if you take the Constitution, yes, there's huge uproar about the Constitution, you know, all the stuff that's wrong with it. But if you talk to ordinary people who may not have read it all in detail, but their sense is that this is a big <coughs> advance on what you had before. You've got a limited term for the president um, and, and various checks and balances that have been uh, written in. Yes, there are ambiguities, there's extremely poor drafting, but it's good and bad. Likewise, the opposition. Finally, finally, last week, what day are we now? We're, we're Tuesday. Last week, they all came together, and you actually saw all the leaders of the different opposition groups standing together in front of the television cameras at a press conference um, <coughs> prior to a, a, a declaration. Um, and so there is some kind of um, the fragmentation that has been so negative. Maybe there are signs that, you know, of, of, of change in that respect, but it's clearly not enough to have an impression for the next elections. Um, the various modes of activism. You may have heard about the black bloc. Everybody in Egypt is talking about the black bloc. Who is the black bloc? What are they? What are they there for? Um, workers' strikes, you know. This is quite a new phenomenon still, you know, if you're affected by the workers' strikes and you haven't quite worked out yet what you think about, you know, workers' rights to strike and all the rest of it. You know, this is, this is a lot, there's a lot of negotiating and understanding uh, to, to, to go through. And then the Muslim brothers the, the, have been forced into the political swim, which means that they are exposed to scrutiny in a way that never happened before and there are various jokes about the party's name in Arabic it's al Horea wal Adala which is uh, freedom and justice and people make various corruptions of that wal Khida wal Nadala which are not easy to to translate maybe Mustafa can do it better than me but I you know negative connot so people joke with the name so in the sense you know they're in the political swim they are they, they are fair game for any kind of political comment. So the reason I'm underlining that kind of mixed feelings, mixed performance, is that in the monograph I tried also to look at the dual nature of the pressures um, on the field of journalism during the uprising and in its um, aftermath. Um, the second thing I want to say um, is the challenge that I faced in writing. Um, is the challenge of whether to concentrate on people and their actions or on structures, laws, institutions, organizations. Um, that latter territory, the structures, is my comfort zone. It's the stuff I normally write about. I'm a professor of media policy. And I usually write about media governance, you know, ownership, laws on control, uh, laws on uh, content, ownership, and such like. Um, but this study was commissioned by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. And the subject is Egyptian journalism. And when I agreed to write it, the reason I did so is because I know lots of Egyptian journalists. And I really admire many of the journalists that I know. They are remarkable, resourceful people whose work played a very big part in the groundswell of protest that was going on for a number of years before it actually exploded uh, in 2011. Now, there are some international organizations who think or thought that you know, problems of media under Arab dictatorships are, um, are problems of journalism. You know, that's the logic that says, you know, you just parachute in a few people to train um, and suddenly, you know, the media will start promoting democratization. Well, yes, I mean, in Egypt there are uh, problems with journalism, but what I wanted to demonstrate as clearly as possible was that um, journalism as such may actually be the least of the problems in Egyptian media, and insofar as it is a problem, it's not one that can be resolved by a quick fix of, you know, a few training courses. 
because there are so much bigger structural issues to be addressed. Massive questions relating to, and um, David said that I'll present findings. Well, you know, in the book you will find that I talk about um, the future of the huge state-owned media organisations with massive debts, huge workforces, you know, in the tens of thousands, 43,000 people in the broadcasting corporation, 31,000 in the media, um, in the state-owned press. Um, massive questions about who now is, draft who is drafting the media laws that are going to be derived from the principles of the Constitution, what will they say? And then another issue that tends not to get as much coverage as perhaps I think it should, which is how journalists organize themselves. You know, what are the mechanisms and means by which they can represent themselves and decide what they think is ethical and professional and so on. So, yes, there are major structural issues which are addressed in the book, but I wanted to write a study about journalists <laughs> and journalism, which is basically writing about people and practices. So you won't find a huge dose of political economy in the work. Instead, you will find um, that I address it from the point of view of people and initiatives. And, um, and I've tried to make those understandable to the reader by presenting them from various different perspectives. So there's four main chapters. The first chapter is, takes the form uh, of a kind of a linear chronology, except it's not one, but two. So I do two narratives that focus on different sets of events that were going on in parallel during the same period. The second chapter is a series of portraits in which I take the uh, example of some specific named journalists and I look at their backgrounds I look at their professed opinions about you know, what does it mean to be a journalist. I look at the battles that they've had with media owners. Um, and when I say, say these people are resourceful, you know, that takes, there's a lot of courage and perseverance and persistence that is demonstrated in these battles with, with various people in positions of power. And then also how they deal with the pros and cons of social media. You know, the challenges of media convergence that, that, that we all face. Um, the third chapter, uh, which is called Stimuli um, for a Public Service Ethos, this one looks at ta tangible evidence of the interest and enthusiasm that exists for public service media in the true sense of the word service, right? So what they've got is government media, not even public sector media, but media that serve the government, and there is a huge body of opinion that understands and knows and wants public service media, media that serve the public interest. And then finally, this issue that I said about representation of journalists, um, I discuss that in chapter four. And I look at the legal tangle that is obstructing journalists from being able to organize themselves um, how they want to. And then the research ends with them. Um, recommendations and that doesn't come naturally to me to be prescriptive I like to be analytical and not to prescribe but that is the format of the challenges series so I force myself to do it and and the thing is that when it comes to uh, recommendations I've tried not to tell people how to behave I've tried to say how the structures um, should be rectified you know how the legal and organizational bases of journalism uh, should be modified, improved, reorganized. And so now, um, I've probably taken more time than I said I was going to, um, I'm just going to highlight four points from the recommendations. And I'm going to do so in the light of events that have taken place since I finished writing, just to bring you up to date so that you've got, you take away something from this session that is over and above what's in the book. Um, right, so there's a recommendation in there about um, how the Constitution will be interpreted when it comes to writing provisions uh, for licensing broadcast media. Um, and, I mean, many, I mean, I'm not the only person saying this, many people are saying that 
Egyptian domestic law should be brought into line with the country's obligations under international law. A lot of people in Egypt and, in, and out don't actually know what those obligations are. So that's like if you take Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that's the freedom to receive and impart information and ideas regardless of media and regardless of frontiers. Now, that has a big implication for licensing of broadcasters. And I'm just going to give you a quick example of how the um, present kind of persistent uncertainty over legislation about licensing, how it undercuts good journalism. So I'm going to take the example of 25 TV, which is mentioned in, in, in the book. It's a project that was launched very soon after the uprising, started in April 2011, with a very small budget, um, a staff of eager young people, experts in social media, many of them recruited from protesters in Tahrir Square, um, it had an exciting offer of programming that was integrated with online platforms, both in gathering um, content and news and in delivering it. And the owner made a big thing of spotting <coughs> new talent, um, avoiding the massive costs of celebrities and stars. Just before we came in, we were talking about mm -hmm. some of what the famous journalists currently are capable of earning. But so this guy, Mohammed Gaha, when he started 25 TV, he wanted to film in the street because it's cheaper than studios. He wanted new talent, young people who wouldn't cost millions and millions of pounds. Um, and today, 25 TV is no longer broadcasting. It lasted about a year and a half. And that means, the fact that it's not there means that Egyptians are deprived of a good journalistic project. Young journalists are deprived of a good training ground. And there's less media diversity. And if you, ex the interesting thing, and the point I want to make, is that if you look for the exact reason why is 25 TV no longer <coughs> broadcasting, you come up against the lack of transparency that makes good journalism so hard in Egypt. Now, 25TV's owner blamed uh, the closure on the inability to get a license, but what actually happened, and this is a bit technical, but if you imagine there are physical satellites, right, in space, um, and there's also a virtual satellite that rents space on the physical satellites, which means you can effectively be on... So, Nilesat is under kind of Egyptian, effectively, government control. 25 TV had space on Nilesat, but not directly. Syrian channels were taken off Nilesat. This effect affected the broadcasting potential of 25 TV because it was like it was being interfered with and jammed. There was no explanation from no Nilesat, no alternative offered, and no budget for the channel to find an alternative, having paid the, you know, the, the rent, to find an alternative um, uh, outlet. At the same time, an alternative but not incompatible explanation is that there is a mix-up of branding, potentially, between 25 TV, youth-oriented, secular, innovative, and Misra 25, which is the Muslim Brotherhood channel, which started slightly after 25 TV, which has a, got a different approach. 25 TV were working on how can they distinguish their name from Misra 25. Well, you can imagine, Misra 25 weren't at all upset when 25 TV no longer existed. So, I mean, this, you know, it's all very murky and who knows the real reason. Now, 25 TV was doing a passable job, and I'm, I'm coming to the end now. Um, <laughs> sorry, because right. I saw the, wa uh, saw the, the watch. Um, was doing a passable job of, of serving the public interest. Um, and I mentioned in the study that um, <coughs> that private media, uh, privately owned media, have been f performing the tasks that you would expect from a public service uh, media provider. And they did so for good commercial reasons, because if you want to get an audience, then you, do, you give them the material that is relevant and interesting to them. But more and more people are realizing now that you can't rely on the private commercial channels to do anything other than serve the interests of their owners. 
give you the example of On TV, which you may have heard of. It's quite one of the more prominent uh, channels, owned by an Egyptian, somebody who was very kind of politically prominent. He sold it. He sold it to a Tunisian. Okay, well, the Tunisian has got a project of like, trying to counter Gulf, Gulf influence in North Africa. But, you know, if, if you can just sell a station like that, you know, then you... Where are you vis-a-vis -vis kind of public service commitment? Two very quick points. One is about local media, which is addressed in here. Um, under Mubarak, all media, private and public, were heavily focused on Cairo. And this is part of the kind of pathology of dictatorship, that people were divided because the country didn't know itself. You know, people in Cairo don't know the provinces, and, and um, the provinces only know Cairo. And that's beginning to erode to a degree, and there's a huge appetite for local media, um, which we can maybe talk about a bit mm. more in the, in the questions, because I shouldn't hog the floor any longer. Um, and then finally, um, the whole question of how do you support the kind of day-in, day-out advocacy effort that keeps um, media issues in the public eye and kind of raises the level of public discourse about media so that you can have healthy discussions about regulation, um, you know, about ethics and responsibility and so on. And there is a kind of really, we're at a very critical stage now. This is a window where, you know, as I say, there's a, a lot of drafting that's going to be going on. Um, and so that business of bringing Egypt's media laws in line with its obligations under international law, it's an ongoing task that needs dedicated effort day in, day out. Thank you, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. you. You've done a great job of trying to encapsulate a lot of material in a, in a, in a very short sort of um, presentation. Mustafa, on to you for next in terms of response, in terms of somebody who's been a journalist working on the ground. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's uh, not my first time to read a book for uh, Naomi, actually. She wrote uh, uh, several books on the Arab media, and one of them was an Al Jazeera, but she usually takes the institutional structuralist side of, of her analysis. But this book is, is different because uh, and you have to buy it, because it takes, uh, it takes things from below. It starts with the people uh, uh, as research is start to going on Egypt and the Arab region as well. It's not very institutionalized per se, but it, it takes from the people. And honestly, what I feel in, in interesting in this book is that I, I can see myself in the book. It's a kind of biography of myself. I started in journalism a kind of 12 years ago in Egypt. Uh, I was working for Al Ahram, and I totally feel what is being written because it's it's moving in the uh, 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 cycles or stages in a way. So, um, uh, if you want to work in journalism 12 years ago in Egypt, you have to two ways. Either is the first one is nepotism. You have to your father or one of your family should be very influential enough working in journalism or kind of senior official in the m army or in the media or whatever, and then you find your way via that. That's why it's very funny. It's, it's amazing. If you look at the names in, in uh, Egyptian superstars in media, they all the time coming with uh, uh, inheritance. So, so you find Tamir Amin, Ala Amin, they are the sons of Amin. And then you find the, uh, it, it goes uh, like that, and then you find uh, just all the names coming with uh, uh, either the father or the family, they are very related. Uh, Amr Adib, and you find Imad Adib, and you find the wife of Amr Adib in the media as well. So it's a very kind of, it's a, think of it, the family, it's a kind of a clan relationship. On the other one, the other way to do journalism in Egypt is you are coming from a middle middle class like myself. The first group is the upper middle class the bourgeoisie, if you like, if, if you're coming from Marxist background. And the other group is the new, the middle middle class or the lower middle class like myself. And those people are, tend to, I would call them under the sun journalists because simply the upper class needs lower classes to help them in a way because those people are 
uh, very very uh, working in a certain atmosphere don't they don't like to exert effort they come to the position by birth rather than by merit so they need other people who are working hard to help them and this is the only way that you get into journalism and just uh, other than that it's not the end of the problem because uh, as Naomi said and and thank you for focusing on the the syndicate side if you want to be a journalist in Egypt you should have the card this is the first question is being asked to you if you go and uh, get married for example my wife is here you have the one of the question being asked do you have the card because and if you being stopped in the street everyone is asking you do you have the card and if you do anything you being asked do you have the card one simple reason is that because it's only one institution in Egypt, one syndicate, which is the sole representative, statutory representative in Egypt, which is the journalist syndicate. And in order to be a journalist, you need to be a member of this syndicate. But it's not an easy road because simply it's, uh, it's one syndicate and it's controlled by the state. The state gives finance to this syndicate. It's highly lucrative to be to have the card of this syndicate because they offer you pension, they offer you money, and these are essential. They offer you health insurance, and these things are very important in a country like Egypt where you don't have NHS, uh, and you cannot be very, very proud of them in the Olympics uh, inaugural ceremony. But so in order to have the card, you need to have a fixed contract. And this is where the trick is, because many journalists, uh, when they get into journalism, they need to get a fixed contract in order to get to their syndicate and have the card. And this is not an easy road. There are a lot of, you are subject to the whims, as you describe it in the book, the whims of uh, editors in chief, uh, the editor in chief in the newspaper or uh, wh where you are working for, because he can tell you, he can start bargaining. If you do what I tell you, you're gonna get a contract. And if you get a contract, you get the card from the syndicate. And it works like that. And it's not very easy. All attempts to have independent or rival syndicates are not working because the state is, is, is standing behind one institution. And if you get into journalism, if you got the card, very happy, you got married because you have the card or among other reasons, what you still have, you have, still have that legislation. And unfortunately, the law is not standing on the side of journalists at the time of Mubarak. You can be easily dismissed. You can be easily arrested. One of the superstars that we mentioned uh, uh, just before the discussion, Ibrahim uh, uh, Isa, at a certain point of his life, he was sacked, his newspapers closed, and he sat at home, he went back to his village. Remember, we're speaking about the lower middle class. He went back to his village, and he's an unemployed from the most famous journalist in Egypt, or unemployed, no one asks about him, no one giving him a call, unlike being very famous. So what you end up is this is a situation before the time of Mubarak. Now we are moving to the time of Mubarak, if there is a change. Are we very happy with the revolution when it comes to media? And I'll start with the first point of getting into journalism. We can have, we can say yes because the many newspapers are coming up. The law is not restricting the uh, opening of or launch of a newspaper, so it's easy to have a newspaper and it's easy to appoint uh, more people. And different classes, if you take it from this point of view, are coming into the system. So the most of the uh, main presenters, most of many people working in the media are coming from the middle middle class. That makes people more associated with the everyday life problems and ideas that come on the screen. It's not only more kind of uh, just uh, very, very sophisticated and very luxurious kind of reporting. It's getting to what middle class or the lower middle class or poor people in Egypt are suffering from. And if you move to the second point of the contract, the syndicate, sadly until now that you have to get the card because uh, the syndicate uh, of journalists is still the only institution giving you the uh, authorization to be a journalist. All attempts to have alternative uh, syndicates, as was mentioned by Naomi in the book, uh, failed because simply put in mind this is a clientless society where the every institution is supported by the state depending on the state for finance and the state giving finance to a certain syndicate. They are against uh, uh, opening new uh, syndicates and, and offering them money. So until now you need to go to this syndicate to get the accreditation. And the law um, 
it's, uh, it's not very helpful when it comes to the law because the new constitution, if you, uh, before at the time of Mubarak, you have to be afraid of, of crossing the line and criticizing Mubarak. Now you have to be afraid of, of crossing the, the line and criticizing morals. If you read the constitution about the, the media, uh, uh, you find the reference to uh, the moral rules that should be respected by journalists. And this can put another pressure that you have to be very careful and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, with, with what, what you say on the, uh, on the uh, media and what you offer. So the, you have completely uh, uh, different approach in the uh, journalism uh, after Mubarak. Just one final thought. I think that optimism is still there because if you think of revolutions as a kind of, of, of stages or cycles, now we are moving into cycles. This kind of dynamism was missing at the time of Mubarak. You stay, things are stagnant as they are most of the time. Now you have more dynamism coming into the uh, atmosphere. And this is very positive and good for the media as well. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. So over to Walter Ambrose. <coughs> like Naomi, you've written several books about media and the no, Middle East. So not, not, no, I've, I've written, well, one book really one and book. lots of other stuff. Okay, you've written um, about it. So Yeah, I'm an anthropologist. I'm not a journalist, um, never have been, but I write about mass media and popular culture, um, mainly in Egypt, pretty much entirely in Egypt. Um, I was in <coughs> Egypt uh, from August 2010 to August 2012 on research leave. I was supposed to be doing research on the history of Egyptian media during the 20th century. Naomi wrote me a letter of recommendation for the <laughs> grant that I had to do this. Um, so I, I have basically four things that I want to say. Um, uh, and the first one um, is basically to plug the book. Um, writing a book about Egypt's revolution at this stage is like fixing a bicycle while you're riding it. Um, and, and so it was actually a huge achievement for Naomi to be able to write this book, and I can just imagine the, you know, the dilemmas she had to face in order to you know, decide where to stop, what to be included, what to leave out, and so forth. Um, I'm not from a discipline that normally writes about revolutions, but th those who are, um, Mustafa alluded to this at the end of his comments, um, there are those who you might call structuralists who write about revolutions and define them strictly by the outcome, in which case Egypt's revolution um, doesn't really count as a revolution yet. There's another school of sociologists and political scientists who write about revolution who, who look at it more as a process, in which case what's going on in Egypt is very much a revolution and there's no, there's no dispute about it really. But you could see this in terms of how people reacted to the revolution in their institutional lives after the fall of the regime. The immediate feeling um, across the board was a kind of triumphalist, we won. Um, and, and, and it's like the sky is the limit, it's morning in Egypt, anything is possible. Over the months, you could see that sentiment gradually changing into a slightly more grim, we can't go back. You know, the genie is out of the bottle, can't put it back, you know, it's, it's, it, there's no going back now. Um, and now, well, you could see that within, within a year or two after the revolution changing over to it's going to take a long time. Um, Naomi's book actually um, you know, kind of tracks this kind of feeling very well. Um, and, and one thing that I would recommend it for is what she's actually done is, is written about all Egyptian institutions. It wasn't just journalism. The same sorts of processes were going on in the universities, the same processes were going on in all public sector institutions. Everybody assumed immediately after the revolution that everything old was going to be swept away and people would be able to rewrite the rules from scratch. And of course, they came to a gradual realization that the old guard wasn't just going to get up and walk away so easily and that it was going to take a long time indeed. Now, my second point is, um, is that we should be careful to avoid um, the sentiment of if the truth is out there, it will prevail. Um, and Naomi's book also does not fall into this trap. Um, but, but let me illustrate this with a couple of uh, examples that she mentions in her book. One was the, uh, the interview, well, I guess it was a debate really, on, on TV between the novelist Alaa Aswani 
and Ahmed Shafi, the guy who ran for president eventually against Morsi. This was actually very early in the revolution. It was, it was just after the fall of the regime. Um, it was while Shafi was still um, prime minister, as Mubarak had tried to appoint him um, after he left office. Um, and, and the book mentions that, that I mean, it, it was an astonishing moment. I didn't see it live, but everybody told me about it, and I watched it on YouTube the next day. Al Aswani just savaged him. It was like a bulldog. He wouldn't let Shafiq silence him. He wouldn't stop asking questions. He kept pushing, pushing, pushing. I mean, to me and to most of the people I knew, it was an utter humiliation. It was just the most astonishing thing to see. Um, it was great. I had a friend who was uh, uh, riding, a, uh, riding a train on the metro when that happened, and people were talking about it. She was on the, it was somebody who was on the women's car, and actually um, the result was not so great. It actually, for many people, the, the reaction was just the opposite. Um, there were many people who actually were very upset that this sort of grandfatherly-like old man had been treated so badly. And, and, and this goes, just always goes to remind us that, you know, one of the dangers of this kind of media convergence world is that we tend to see things in our own little media bubble. So, you know, for me, the savaging of Shafiq by Aswani was fantastic, but you can't actually be sure that that was the reaction across all of the public. There certainly were people for whom that was not the case. Another example was the Kazibun exhibitions. Uh, filmmakers were, um, were, were doing videos that were exposing the lies of SCAF, and this happened a few months after, uh, after SCAF had been in power and people were, were turning against them. Um, and these were taken around to neighborhoods and shown to people on, um, you know, impromptu screens and sheets or whatever on walls. Um, and, and the people who made these films and the people who were promoting them were always talking about them in the sense that this is the truth. People will see the truth. Of course, they'll come to our side. And that wasn't necessarily the reaction of all. If you walked around the edge of, of where these things were showing and listened to what people were saying, the reaction was often dead opposite. They were angry at the film and not so much at SCAF and angry that, uh, you know, that people would be doing these sorts of things to people who, of course, had the best of intentions and maybe making some mistakes but, um, and so forth. Now, my third point is the perils of celebrity, which is, again, is another thing that, that the book doesn't it's a, it's a mistake that the book doesn't fall into. Naomi points out um, the importance, actually, in the years leading up to the revolution and during and after the revolution of talk shows um, and the fact that the hosts of these talk shows couldn't be silenced because even if there was um, ownership, uh, you know, sort of ownership of media outlets by cronies of the regime, there were enough of them that if you had to leave one, if you were forced to leave one show, you could go to another one. Um, but for every Mona Shazley, who is, you know, sort of one of the heroes of these sorts of things, there's a Taufi Okasha. She has a, a very brief section when she's doing profiles of some of these talk show hosts. It's very brief. Okasha, I mean, I, Okasha was basically a trickster. He was a guy who was a sort of failed politician for the NDP who turned himself into a broadcaster and had a, I mean, you could call it a talk show, but it was really more like a monologue show. He would sit there and, and go for three hours. Now, the thing is, um, he, he went through a kind of rise and fall. He actually became very prominent. By the time Ahmed Shafi almost beat Morsi in the election, Everybody was talking about this guy. Everybody was listening to him. And he was saying crazy stuff. It was all, you know, Masonic plots and, you know, weird combinations of, you know, Hezbollah and Israel and the United States and the European Union trying to destroy Egypt just for the sake of destroying it. All this kind of stuff. I mean, the guy, you know, the guy actually um, was, was important and perhaps still is. And also, you know, for every Reem Maggot, who's another one of these heroes of on TV, there's a Khaled Abdullah. Naomi's book actually doesn't say anything about the Islamic broadcasting, but they're also very important. And he, Khaled Abdullah is another trickster kind of character. He, he basically just sits there and tells lies for hours and hours. And, you know, from the perspective of the audience, there isn't necessarily always a clear distinction between. Reem Maggid, who is a brilliant journalist and was, you know, and, and, and very ethical, and someone like Khaled Abdullah, who essentially just sits there and spews, spews lies. Um, and then my final point, which is sort of a summary of all the others, and, and it is inherent in the book as well, beware of teleologies. I mean, the unlocking of what you might call contentious journalism, to, you know, sort of borrow a phrase from Charles Tilley, who writes about contentious politics. Um, 
you know, the idea that, that contentious journalism leads eventually to the promised land um, should be looked at with a bit of skepticism. I mean, the fact that it exists doesn't necessarily lead to that conclusion. An alternative is that contentious journalism um, is in permanent tension with an establishment. Um, at the audience becomes fragmented. For every Huffington Post, there's a Fox News. Um, and, and, I, and I mention this at the, at the end to, to make the point that what's happening in Egyptian journalism is remarkable by any standards, certainly remarkable by the standards of Egyptian journalism as it's always existed. But to, to some extent, what we're also talking about here is journalism in the world. Um, and this kind of stable relationship between contentious journalism on the one hand and a well-funded um, and sometimes state-backed uh, establishment on the other um, is maybe not something that we should assume is going to lead to an inevitable teleology leading towards a better informed public and inevitably freer journalism. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, there's a huge number of points raised there to, that we could discuss, but um, I may come back to Naomi to respond to some of them later, but I think for the moment I'd like to open up to discussion and sort of get a sense of questions from people in the room who want to ask them. So if you want to ask a question, put a hand up and Kate at the back or, uh, will come to you with a microphone. So there's uh, a question just at the back there and then there's one at the front here. So the gentleman at the back, do you want to start first? And if you could say who you are, it would help sure. us. And I may take two, a couple of questions together and then ask panelists to respond depending on who the question is addressed to. Um, hello, my name is Etienne Duval. I'm a French TV journalist, freelance. I, I'm one of those trainers you referred to. I've just come back from uh, training TV, uh, Tunisian TV journalists. So I'm very interested in the role of public broadcasting uh, in the future in the region. Um, are you very pessimistic that it can embody the values that we identify with it um, here? Or do you think that will be left to private international broadcasters? Or Thank public you. international broadcasters, for that matter? Thank you. I'm going to take another, there's a question at the front here. Hi, uh, my name's Alex. I'm a uh, freelance journalist as well. I was just wondering, um, particularly with regards to support for the Muslim Brotherhood, how much do you think the media and journalism in Egypt is uh, uh, has has a kind of a, an urban rural divide? I mean, a, a lot of what's been said about kind of a lot. I mean, you touched upon this uh, briefly. But what I heard a lot about with regard, particularly the new media um, and kind of online journalism often seems to be very kind of urbanized and referring to a kind of a middle class sort of Cairo based uh, liberal elite in a way and how much do you think the kind of rural population uh, is kind of untouched and unaffected by a lot of the kind of changes that have happened as a result? Okay, um, I'll go to Naomi, f uh, oh, actually I'll take this third one from this lady at the front and then, thank you. Just one last question, um, the most important thing for me you just um, so the most important thing for me is, put, is to tell the truth. I'm a photojournalist. It's about integrity, which you raise as an issue. And it's about telling the truth so that you're informing the public of what's happening. And those are, for me, the most inherent characteristics for any journalist, whether they're writing something, or they're snapping something, or they're filming something. And certainly, the media, as we know it today, and as we watch it on YouTube, we have a compromised, very highly compromised view of what's happening because you have amateurs that, and, and I'm not diminishing the amateur's role at all, but you have amateurs that are viewing something and not asking the who, what, where, and when questions, thinking about integrity, thinking about telling the truth, showing something that is focused of what's happening wherever it is particularly what's happening in North Africa and in the Middle East today as we know it. And I think this has an extraordinary influence beyond the, and, and I'm really welcome what the panel's going to say, beyond what the, what the politics are and how media is established and who is responding to what, and, and particularly in Egypt, which is a fascinating situation given where Egypt was three years ago. Okay. Economically, and where it is today. So that's my view. Okay. Just a question. 
Okay, thank you. I'll come, there's another question, but I'll come to that in the next round, if that's okay, but I'll come to you. Um, Naomi, do you want to respond to yes, one of I'm, those? And I'm then I'll not bring in looking, the other. Uh, well, I can do kind of all of them, and I might bring in some responses to uh, as, Yep, okay. yep. I'm not knocking training in any shape or form. It's just the point about training is that, um, you know, you can train people in good practice, but then if the structures, you know, if the management where they work, if the conditions where they work are not conducive to them implementing it, then that, you know, that's just, it's just such a shame. Um, I share your pessimism about the future, um, um, of, about the future of the public broadcasters, because, I mean, in Egypt, the public broadcaster has just uh, gone behind the government, you know, whichever government it was, Mubarak, Skaf or Morsi, they're behind them and they see their job as kind of a, a, kind of a mobilization. Um, <clears throat> but um, the question about public service broadcasting, I think the thing to remember, um, and there's an expert in the room on this, uh, Elizabeth Smith. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I will say this, but I mean, I'm, you know, defer to, to greater knowledge. Uh, public service broadcasting is about, it's about a landscape. It's about a system, not just institutions. And so, of course, you can have um, all sorts of, you know, broadcasters and media providers who uh, see their role as providing a public service, whether or not they are, you know, however they are ultimately funded. And, and I would contest, I mean, I was in a meeting yesterday where people kept talking about commercial media in Egypt. Well, I contest, you know, whether and which media are really commercial there, because they are, you know, the ones that are private are part of big conglomerates, so there's cross-subsidizing. That the money from advertising is the advertising market is terribly distorted. So, this idea of a kind of a dichotomy between a, sort of a public service and a private commercial it, it doesn't really work like that. So, I think you know one has to work at all levels um, and um, to work at all levels in, 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 in the training. Um, I mean, and that's where um, that business of, of what is journalism, I mean, and, and uh, Walter mentioned the ranters who I didn't really talk about much because I really wanted to talk about the people that I consider uh, doing journalism, but one can't avoid, you know, some of the more sort of high profile people. But the thing about fact checking, I mean, it's not taken for granted among, the, you know, uh, part of the recommendations for what should happen in media in Egypt at the moment is that there should be some kind of a pact or a, you know, co a, a, an accord between media owners across platforms that you know, media owners will make it, will provide the circumstances in which journalists can actually do the fact checking and the, 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 yeah, the, dub, the you know, the, the, the getting things from every side. That is what, what we consider to be um, journalism. The point about the Muslim Brother and the rural urban divide, I would question that Muslim brothers are a lot of urban capitalists, you know? Um, the, the one, the, the person who was the first candidate to be president, Muslim Brother candidate, owns a, a chain of, of, of stores. So the idea that, you know, people who vote yeah, for the I Muslim Brothers are actually countryside people is not, it's a kind of a, it's a dichotomy that I think people in Egypt wouldn't necessarily recognize. Um, and the voting patterns, actually, for the constitution and the two rounds of the presidential um, voting. The, the <clears throat> if you look by province, um, you know, rural and urban, there's some very interesting um, outcomes, but not necessarily always for the, you know, n not for the, not because it's a, there's a clear urban rural divide between who votes for what but there the, the, the sort of syphology of, of Egypt which is something that one never knew really you know <laughs> in the past um, is, is a very fascinating thing and, and um, you know but I just question this idea of a sort of a, a rural urban divide that is reflected in in political parties but um, that mm, mm. Stuff I might want to say uh, something about do you want to come in on that? Then uh, yeah, just, I, think, I think uh, just, uh, I agree with you to a point uh, on the, this urban-rural uh, divide because simply 
Muslim Brotherhood, the well, you have to think of geographic determinism when you are thinking of uh, where Muslim Brotherhood supporters are, because Egypt is depending on the River Nile. And a lot of uh, people like Montesquieu and Gamal Hamdan, these scholars say that it's, a, it's a still very, very rural until now because it's agricultural, agrarian society until now. And the base of the Muslim Brotherhood, when it comes to numbers, are in the rural areas, not the, in the urban areas. And but there is two, there is an evidence of that, and there is a problem for that. The evidence is that when it comes to Cairo, which is the capital, people voted by majority against the constitution draft, unlike other governorates where the Muslim Brotherhood supporters are. But you have to look as well the uh, the capital as where the most media outlets are based. And those are owned by businessmen who are very liberal capitalists against Muslim Brotherhood in a sense. And those people, their voices are louder because they have more money they are clever, they are sophisticated, and they have experience because they were close to Mubarak. Put in mind Tariq bin Ammar. This is a guy who owns OTV right now. He is the close to the Tunisian president. He's a cousin of Tunisian president, if I remember correctly. And he, he got this ownership from Sawiris, who was close to Mubarak at a certain point. He's a big businessman, he's a billionaire. So those people have voice which is stronger than the Muslim Brotherhood, which is still, I, uh, I bet, it's still uh, uh, ruralized. Okay, Walter, do you want to respond to one of these points? Yeah, I guess I'll talk about the urban-rural divide as well. Although I'm uh, actually spending too much time on that. Naomi wanted to talk about journalism, but uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean I, I, nobody really knew how that was going to pan out in an election until there were relatively free elections. So to be honest, I think a lot of people were surprised at how strong both the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis were um, in the provinces as opposed to the cities, which is not to say that there's a, a very simple rural-urban divide, of course not. And you know, as Naomi said, the, you know, the, the top echelon of the, of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, you know, are very urban and very committed to the same economic program that Gamal Mubarak espoused, whereas many of the rank and file are not. I mean, and, and they view the Muslim Brotherhood as potentially being, you know, they're, they're um, you know, riding in on a white horse to, you know, their white knight riding in to save them from savage capitalism, which ain't going to happen. Um, and so there's, there's potential for fragmentation there as well. In terms of media, I mean, the, the, there, there are certain media that reach into the countryside quite well. Obviously, satellite broadcasting, which reaches the countryside now as well as it does the rest of the country. The guy that I've been writing about, Tofi Okasha, I've been trying to write a chapter in a book about him, um, was assumed to be appealing mainly to uh, a rural audience um, and very much not. I mean, he was, he was like totally, absolutely opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood and to the Islamists. And the assumption always was that the people he was appealing with were, you know, simple-minded people in the countryside. People in the countryside are not necessarily so simple-minded, of course. The selfies, for example, um, tend to be uh, conservative but independent. And many times when they're voting for Salafi candidates, they're actually doing a protest vote against the Muslim Brotherhood, which is much more disciplined and hierarchical and just another patronage machine that would replace the state. But obviously satellite broadcasting is more, more important for reaching the countryside than um, you know, the, the convergence of, um, of um, internet and other forms of media. Although, of course, what's broadcast on the satellite might very well be a product of this convergence. Okay, thank you. There's, um, there's a lady over there, and then another question there. So we'll take, uh, we'll take two questions here, and then one at the back in this round. Yes. Okay, I, am, I believe I am a journalist. I am a journalist. Can you, can you speak up a little bit? Just so okay, we, yeah, okay. Thank you. I, I am a journalist. Yeah. I, I believe I am a journalist. I'm a trained journalist. But I, I, what I don't understand is that are we saying that journalism should be practiced differently with different countries? Are you saying that um, in one country, journalists should be one thing, and in this, for example, in Nigeria, journalists should be one thing, Egypt, journalists should be something else, in, in England, so journalists should be something else? Because from what you are saying, up there, 
it's like you're saying let's accept journalism as as a different entity from country to country is that is that is is, is that fair no journalism we should stand for what we believe anywhere in the world whatever mo the case may be okay thank you that's very clear and just behind you there's another question uh, Sean Kevlar, I'm running a, a series of debates in uh, uh, e e Egypt, Tunisia, and in, in Jordan at the moment, televised debates with Tim Sebastian. Uh, what I was asking is one of the facts that came up in our recent debates was the number of arrests which are of journalists, which has happened to <coughs> Egyptian journalists uh, under the Muslim Brotherhood, is running at uh, two or three times the rate than it was under Mubarak. Um, and there's a sense in which I, wouldn't, uh, I want to ask the panel, um, as experts, I mean, whether they feel there is a, a, a real chill wind coming now with the Muslim Brotherhood, or whether it's a function of just greater plurality. Okay, thank you. And there's a gentleman at the back. Hello, Andrew Bowers to a private eye. Um, I just wanted to follow on from that. In the early days, there were some documents found with the Mukhabarat which was that software that... Would you, sorry to be bored, would you mind standing up just because then the panellists can see you and it will help. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, Andrew Basil Private. In the early days, there was some software that was found with the Mukabrat that enabled the tracing of Twitter and, and then that was used in police interrogations, especially against journalists. I wanted to know if there'd been any more of that found because uh, I think it was produced by a British company, Gamma, and w yeah. whether um, that was still going on anything like that so following on from that last question okay and uh, I will take one question from the lady at the back there um, and then we'll see whether we have a chance for another round thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm an MA student in the University of Westminster and I'm doing my MA dissertation about feminism Egyptian feminism through social media and I didn't want to know um, what does um, Naomi thinks about um, the role of women, Egyptian women, during the revolution, and how did it change after the revolution? Thank Is that you. a question about journalism or a question about...? About um, online journalism, actually, I'm about, about, doing about blogosphere, feminism, okay. Okay. feminist blogosphere in Egypt. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, so four questions. One about journalism as something with universal values or different to different places, then about arrests and repression, then about software and tracking people on Twitter and other things, and then about Egyptian feminism and blogosphere. Um, Naomi, do you want to start and deal, I don't, I don't yes. expect you to deal with all of those, but well, just I'll deal do with my one best. or two of them yeah, if you can. No, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, part of my motivation for writing the report was to demonstrate how journalists in Egypt identify and relate with in journalism internationally, i.e. Egyptian journalists are, want to do what journalists want to do everywhere. These are the kinds of journalists that I mostly wrote about in the book. So I completely agree with you. And if you've got a different impression from the presentation, then, then I'm sorry. And in fact, one of the recommendations I made was that um, Egypt is a little bit cut off from international membership bodies. So the International Federation of Journalists, which kind of brings journalists together around the world, Egyptian journalists officially don't belong to it because it also includes Israeli journalists and they have a very strong anti-normalization policy within the journalist syndicate. So the Egyptian journalists syndicate deals with the IFJ, but just not officially. And part of the recommendation was, I, one of the things I felt was that there's lots of scope for international membership bodies, you know, editor, editors networks, um, journalism networks, newspaper networks, um, broadcast networks, to actually encourage Egyptians to belong. And then it would be one way of, of, of setting benchmarks that people, you know, making benchmarks of performance and um, that, pe that people would subscribe to and it would be kind of more of an, in, you know, that within Egypt, those international um, standards would be more um, uh, apparent, more publicized, more, more exposed. Um, on the, yes, and it's a shocking, the arrests and the, and the, um, the cases that have been raised. Um, I mean, since August, since the, since the new, um, is it because of the Muslim Brotherhood or is it because of gr greater plurality? Um, I think it's a lot of score settling. 
because you know you've got people who were on the receiving end of that treatment for a long time and now they're on the other side you know wouldn't you want to you know i mean it's a kind of a i think it's a, a you know it's a natural period um but yes, it is shocking, and it needs much more publicity because that's one of the thing, things that people in the country feel that, you know, that like the, the rest of the world thinks, okay, they had their revolution, it's all done and dusted, everything's fine now. You know, we use this term Arab Spring. Well, spring is transient, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, it's followed by other seasons. So, um, so, so, so absolutely, yes. The Gamma story, I knew about it in relation to Bahrain. Um, I mean, what I would say about whether the security are having a sort of um, an or orchestrated, um, like really thought out policy with regard to, you know, what software they use and how they trace. Looking at the chaotic situation, I wouldn't have thought that there's that much kind of masterminding going on, but I may be wrong. Um, and then the feminism and, and women in the blogosphere in Egypt. Um, Oh, what to say? Um, I mean, it's just one of the things I tried to... The cover of the book has got women on it. <laughs> um, the, 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 I talked about women journalists a lot. The list of journalists has got loads of female names. There is no sense that women in any, um, uh, in any area of journalism take a back seat. Um, Yes, I mean, as all people, all uh, discussion in Egypt under the old regime, kind of, if you wanted a de decent, if you wanted decent coverage and um, uh, some level of, of, of um, open, uh, unedited, like uncensored talk, you had to do it online. And hence the Egyptian blogosphere was known as being political. Um, you know, the blogosphere generally is not necessarily political internationally, but the Egyptian blogosphere was, was highly politicized. And, and the, you know, the women bloggers were as much part of that as, 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 as anyone else. But, um, I mean, I know there's, you know, the sexual harassment stories and um, campaigns and issues that um, have, uh, have gone on. Actually, I'm minded... Um, Walter was talking about people who sit there and do monologues in what are supposed mm. to be talk shows. I watched Lamis Hadidi, who is the wife of um, um, Amradeep. Amradeep, as that Mustafa mentioned. I watched her on CBC talk show, uh, Hena La Sima, like two nights ago or something. And she was introducing, this is going to be a debate about violence against women. And she went on and on and on with a long spiel. And I was looking at, you know, how long is she going to go on for talking, telling us that she's going to talk about violence against women? And then she switched to the Hamada story, the guy who'd had his clothes stripped, you know, and they went on about that. When did we get to the violence against women? Sorry, I'd given up and, 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 and left it by that time. I mean, I question to what degree are these, I mean, a presenter that goes on talking for sort of, you know, 20 minutes. Um, I mean, those, that's a standard of journalism that, you know, that people are very, seem to be too tolerant of it. But the thing is, they have a lot of choice. So I guess that a lot of people would have switched over by the time they'd had enough of Lamis. I mean, a lot of people watch Lamis Hadidi, but how much of it could you take, um, you know, in one night? I'm not sure. Well, that's a positive <laughs> side of fragmentation, I guess. And, <coughs> and that's, you know, so there's good women and there's bad women. Walter, do you want to come back in on any of those points? Um, yeah, I mean, on the on the feminism point, I mean, the, the the one point that I would make is that the issue of sexual harassment actually was already coming into public awareness before the revolution. Just before the revolution, there was a film in the theaters called Six Seven Eight. It was a, it was a narrative film. Um, it was about sexual harassment, and then ever since the revolution began, I mean, see, see the thing about activism in the blogosphere is, yes, it's been there and it's extremely important, but it's not separate from the actual world. I mean, you've got an actual world and a real world, an actual world and a virtual world, and, and the two things are mutually constitutive, but it is very much about space. So if, fem if, if activism for feminists or any other cause can flourish online, it still has to be able to have public space. It still has to be in the public space. 
Um, and that's a huge problem now. Um, in some ways, things are getting worse. I mean, it may be that the issue is even more in people's radar than it was before the revolution. But um, I mean, I would say that the situation now is fairly grim. And there's a danger of activism being pushed into an only online sphere, which uh, I think is very problematic. Thank just you. just to yeah. say that the Constituent Assembly that wrote the Constitution had 100 people, and it was six or seven women? Either six or seven, I can't remember. Yeah. Stafford, do you want to come back on one of those points? Yeah, very quickly regarding the uh, point of localization. One of the main problems for Egyptian media right now, I agree with you, is that very localized. I still remember just uh, no one cares about the international uh, covenant of human rights or any kind of international uh, thing. And many, I have to confess, actually, many of the, uh, the journalists in Egypt can't speak English because many of them are coming from these kind of certain classes. And I remember that I got a phone call from a kind of, uh, the editor in chief who has big names in Egypt and he said that I can't speak English I feel embarrassed when I go abroad and, and I can't understand I went to Washington and, and they keep making laugh of me because I can't speak English and I told them that you can get English lessons and he said I'm very busy and he doesn't so in, in a way it's it, it's still he doesn't care that's why you have a problem with the training right now what's what's really problematic with the training because a lot of international media associations go to Egypt for kind of 10 days do the training uh, just standards and uh, they have a nice chap coming with speaking very nice English and then he do he has a translator of course because general is not speaking English and he stays for 10 days he go back and people back to normal there's no change because the institutions are corrupt and no one can dare to change it put in mind that the main building the TV building in Egypt the state building has 40,000 people working in it it's a time bomb you cannot do anything about it. regarding women I think one of the big problems right now because politics take over and women are coming in a second priority maybe third or fourth so if you make a program on women you don't have viewership you don't have ads you didn't so it goes in our political economy cyclical way of that so it's 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 an issue in a way P I'm put in mind because this is a clientelist society Suzanne Mubarak the wife of Mubarak she was a, a liberal minded when it comes to women pushing for women issues because Suzanne Mubarak is now out of the picture in a way. The state is not taking care. And you have an Islamist government who doesn't care about women. And you have a president who doesn't shake hands with women. It, it, it goes on like that. So you, you, we have a problem in a way. OK. okay. Sorry. You want can, to can I just say, I mean, Suzanne Mubarak was, I mean, the, the fact that she championed women's issues is probably the, the worst thing that could have happened. Because the Mubaraks were hated so much that any cause that they supported became hated with them. So the idea that, you know, that, that the, the, um, I mean, it's almost as if it was sabotage of, of women's rights because people saw it as, um, as you know, as, as, a, as a sort of westernization via the Mubaraks. Um, I'm going to um, draw proceedings to a close now just because um, there's some drinks downstairs and there's lots of time to continue discussion with our panelists, I think, over drinks. I know, um, but I'm sorry if you wanted to ask a question you haven't got in. Um, but um, just to remind people, there's copies of the book here on sale. It's our first book from the Reuters Institute with IB Taurus, our new publishing partner, which we're very pleased about. Um, so you can buy copies of the book there. There's drinks downstairs. And I'd just like you to join with me in thanking Naomi and our panelists for a really interesting discussion. <laughs>